Um, one of the things that causes problems in life is doubts. <laughs> um, doubts, as described in Bhagavad Gita, in the fourth chapter, are like demons. They create obstacles in the practice of our spiritual life. Um, doubts can come about in different categories. We can doubt uh, our ability. We can doubt our relationship. We can doubt Krishna. We can doubt so many things. We can doubt our present situation. We can doubt. Doubting is a uh, very debilitating mental, mentally debilitating situation which can lead to stagnation, to wrong thinking, and ultimately to, you know, spiritual devastation. So by having a working knowledge of the different subject matters that comprises life's trials and tribulations, along with the goal of life, we can overcome these doubts. So by reading, studying Srila Prabhupada's books, you can approach any of the many subjects that may come up. For instance, we can speak about suffering. Why, what is suffering? Why does it come? Even though I'm a good person, I don't want suffering. I do everything not to cause other people's suffering. I live in such a way as to avoid all things that cause myself suffering. Still, I get suffering. Why? Um, there's an answer, and the answer is there in the scriptures and explained nicely in Srila Prabhupada's books. How to deal with suffering how to deal with the cause of our suffering, the apparent cause, the remote cause. Remote cause is what's in the background, what we can't see as the element that is giving us our suffering, or we might even say allowing our suffering to happen. We have an understanding of the broader picture. Knowledge is freedom. <laughs> i give you an example. Um, we have the life of one great Greek philanthropist, scholar, writer, orator, and spiritualist, whose name was Socrates. I'm for sure many of us are familiar through our education in schools, a little bit about Socrates and what he did. But Socrates was in strong belief of the transmigration of the soul. He understood, he had Brahman realization. In other words, he understood and not his body. I live in the body, but I am not the body. I'm the spiritual body being within the body. So he had come to that realization not just theoretically, but completely. And so, being a man of knowledge, being a man of compassion, he also started to preach that knowledge. Uh, this was against the church's present position, where they were teaching that this is the only life, and when you die, you either go to heaven or you go to hell. One life is all you get. <laughs> but Socrates could understand that actually life is eternal. We lived before in another situation and we were living now in the present situation. And based on our activities in this particular situation, this life will live in the future in a different situation. So preaching that, through his writings and also through his meetings with other people, 
he became a threat to the doctrine, the present doctrine of the church. And so the church was actually the ruling power at that time. And so they uh, cautioned him that what you're speaking is not true. And you're influencing so many people. And therefore you should stop. Otherwise we will have to take action against you. Being a man of compassion, a man of knowledge, he wasn't intimidated by their threats. He continued. And of course, when he continued, this brought the, the church upon him and they sentenced him to death by taking a type of poison called hemlock. When he was, just before he was given the poison, he said to his uh, executioners, when you, uh, when I, uh, well, actually, I'm sorry, they said to him, Socrates, when you die, what should we do with you? Thinking in terms of the body. Socrates responded, as far as my body is concerned, you can do whatever you want. But as far as I'm concerned, you'd have to catch me first. So he was completely fearless knowing that although he was losing his present body, he would be living in another situation in the future. So he had that knowledge that I'm eternal and I'm not this body. And so in our Shastras, Prabhupada makes the point that what we're teaching is the principle of immortality. That means we are teaching how to overcome death. Uh, for death, and there are so many statements about the fear of death, the horrors of death, the ultimate principle of death. And therefore, people uh, are afraid of death. People are, uh, don't think about death because they don't want to be reminded of the inevitable. And sometimes they blot out the idea that they will die so strongly that they actually believe they won't. <laughs> of course, um, when King Yudhisthir was speaking to the Yaksha, who was in the form of a, who was his father, Dharmaraj, in the form of a Yaksha, the Yaksha asked him so many questions. Yudhisthir was very astute in knowing all knowledge required. And so when the, when the Yaksha, asked him the final question after answering 50 questions. He asked him, what is the most amazing thing in this world? <laughs> and he said, uh, he said, the most amazing thing in this world is everyone is seeing their friends, relatives, and others succumbing to the principle of death, but they're thinking, it won't happen to me. It's not me. So the Yaksha was very much enlivened by his answer, which was a which was the, a clear and common understanding of how people think. Mm -hmm. So, but devotees, we understand that we're not this body, so we don't die. We live forever, eternally, and depending on what we do in our present life will depend on where we go in the next life. As Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, yam yam smam, yam yam bhavi smaram bhakta, yam yam bhavi, yam yam, what is that? Yam yam, eight five, eight six, yam yam bhavi smaram bhakta, takta ante kalegulam, tam tam vivaiti kontaya, sadasa bhava bhavi taha. Now, whatever you remember at the time of death, there you will go towards your next destination, destination. So consciousness projects the soul to its next destination. So Srila Prabhupada's books are full of both examples 
stories and philosophical explanations of the difference between the body and the soul. Krishna, in the very beginning of the Bhagavad Gita, for at least 20 verses, starting with verse number 13, actually verse number, um, I'm sorry, verse number 11, Krishna explains for 20 verses the difference between the body and the soul. He wants to make the point clear that there's that the soul is eternal, the body is temporary. The soul is not subjected to the laws of material energy. Therefore, the soul lives forever. Uh, so he makes that point. And you find through, throughout the entire Shastras, there's a lot in Bhagavatam about it, that ultimately, not ultimately, actually, realistically, we are eternal. So unless we read and study and understand this principle, not only by hearing it, by, but by going deep into that, the fear of death remains. And it's a false fear because no one dies and no one is born. But how do we learn that? We learn that as one of the many, many subject matters that come by reading and hearing Srila Prabhupada's books. So whatever topic is a concern, whatever obstacle we find ourselves in, whatever uh, knowledge we need in our relationship with Krishna, and of course, the practical points we need in execution of devotional service, in the best way, or the most correct way, everything's there in Prabhupada's books. So we read not simply for knowledge, but to overcome the difficulties in life, to awaken our realization of Krishna through scriptural understanding. And the principle of how everything is coming by way of the hand of the Lord. This is one of the main points in scripture that nothing happens or nothing exists. Nothing exists, nothing happens without connection to the Lord, either directly or indirectly through his different energies. So reading Srila Prabhupada's books and understanding that knowledge is the success of life because knowledge is freedom. As we use the example of Socrates, he had no fear of death because he knew he was, he's going to live after the end of this body. So that is true for all of us. But simply by hearing about it, it's not enough. We need to understand it, get examples of it, and also practice it in our day-to-day -day life. So therefore, Prabhupada's books remain treasure houses of knowledge, practical ways to live. We find even in Srila Prabhupada's books, there are many subjects that are very practical in terms of how to do things, how to keep good health, how to avoid things in life that we need to avoid. Mm -hmm. And what was the ideal lifestyle in the Vedic culture. In our present Western civilization, we live not less than an ideal lifestyle. We don't even live like human beings, according to the way society is organized. We live like, basically like entities who are struggling from day to day to simply exist. That is not life. So coming out of that uh, wrong consciousness that is a place by, uh, placed upon us by the present materialistic society, which are also an illusion about you know, what is the purpose of life and how to live it. 
um, we find freedom in that knowledge. And we also find practical solutions to adapt and how to, to overcome the pitfalls and difficulties, obstacles in life. So this is a special feature. Uh, we're speaking about one aspect of it that we're talking about suffering and death, but that's just a small part of the knowledge that's there. Politics, the ideal political arrangement, economics, what is true economics, perfect economics, economics according to the system that Krishna created, social uh, arrangements, how to live in, in such a way that we live in accordance with the principles of social interaction with other living entities and making a livelihood within that. Uh, therefore, and of course, there is the principles of romance, relationships. I mean, the books carry unlimited subject matters all connected to the spiritual principles, even dealing with the material uh, concerns or the material subject matters. So reading Srila Prabhupada's books, particularly uh, Bhagavad Gita and Srimad Bhagavatam, uh, really he has a vast amount of practical, spiritual, philosophical knowledge that is easily understood with explanations by Srila Prabhupada. A lot of books, spiritual books you read, they have a mystique around their presentations of spirituality where it becomes pretty hard to understand what to do. The Prabhupada not only gives you the uh, principles of spiritual existence, but how to live within that existence in the day-to-day -day life. Uh, so we have a unlimited treasure house of knowledge on so many subjects in depth. One of the biggest concerns in, uh, in people's life is their health. Prabhupada deals with that subject sufficiently a lot through his lectures, but also through his conversations with other devotees and also in his books, How to Live in such a way one can maximize one's health. So if we neglect reading these books, we're just cutting ourselves off from spiritual understanding and the uh, solutions to the problems of life. So therefore, back to the main point, uh, reading, is a requirement. It's not optional for those of us who seriously practice spiritual life. And reading awakens the desire to understand more, which comes in the form of discussions with other persons. Like that. And then when we discuss with other persons, we get even more and more knowledge of the subject matter. So uh, we want every devotee to regularly read Srila Prabhupada's books, particularly Bhagavad Gita, Srimad Bhagavatam. And for understanding the science, the, applicable, the application of the science of bhakti, we have nectar of devotion. And we have that same nectar devotion in a more concise way in nectar of instructions. <laughs> so Srila Prabhupada spent so much time, energy on giving us this, these books because he knew not only they would be helpful, necessary for the devotees in their spiritual practice, but the foundation 
that will be used in the future to understand how to solve all and any problems in present day society or in future society. Okay, so these are some points of the importance of the books and relationships to everything we need to know, everything we want to know, and that is necessary in our life in Krishna consciousness. And even in the practical sense. Just like I was reading Srimad Bhagavatam yesterday, there's one section called Ideal Family Life. So this is in the seventh canto, 14th chapter. And then there's a whole series of about, um, uh, let's see, so many verses. I, I can't remember how many verses there. 47 verses or something like that. What is family life? What is ideal family life? Prabhupada's explanations like that. So even if we want these, this knowledge and for the practical, it's also there in Prabhupada's books. So many things. So. Until we actually start to tap into the books in a regular way and investigate what is available, we won't really appreciate or even have an understanding of what is at, at our hand, what is, it, what is available as far as this unlimited uh, treasure house of knowledge. And as it says, that uh, transcendental knowledge is a principle of freedom. <laughs> By knowledge, you're free. <laughs> okay, any questions or comments? Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. Hare Bo. Guru Maharaj, you were speaking so much about um, how knowledge sets us free. Can you give some practical advice as to how to take sometimes knowledge that we understand theoretically and make it more practical and applicable to our lives? Because sometimes that's the piece that's difficult. Mm -hmm. Yes, when we're when we're when we're uh, afflicted by disease, we understand it's not me that's happening; it's it's happening to my body. Then we have less uh, concern about the effects of what's happening. It's happening to my body; it's not happening to me. We deal with the challenge by taking medication and taking all precautionary and remedial measurements. But at the same time, we understand it's my body is going through it, not me. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, another thing is that people might find some fault or some praise. Somebody might praise you, somebody might find fault with you. But the fault and praise is simply in relationship to my body, so it has nothing to do with me. So we don't take it to heart. We understand they're criticizing my body, they're, crit they're praising my body for whatever reason. So we can, we can become detached to the dualities that come by way of this material energy because it's all related to the body. So that detachment helps us to stay focused on a higher knowledge or higher principle and not to be pulled down to the bodily conception of life like that. So there's two examples that we can use. Thank you um, very much. Yeah, and there's many others, of course. Okay. Happiness and distress are relegated to the mind or body, has nothing to do with us. 
Therefore, in the Shastras, it says one should not become overly despondent in distressful dis situation. One should not become overly elated in situations that, that are of the nature of happiness. One remains fixed in their practice and doesn't become affected by the dualities that come in this world. <laughs> You have to remember both dualities relate to the material energy which is connected to us directly in in terms of our material existence mm -hmm. so these are practical ways to uh, develop the proper consciousness in day-to-day -day life Thanks, Hermes. Yeah, the conditioning is just so super deep. So sometimes, like, we understand that theoretically, but when you're in the moment, the, you, that's when you see, like, how, that's when I see how attached I am to this bodily concept. It's really difficult. When something happens, the immediate response may be on the, on the uh, external level. Or on the, when someone does something to us, we might blame the person, but that even is there for great souls. But then again, second, our second thought is, well, actually there's much more to it than what I'm seeing. And there's where transcendental knowledge can help us understand how to deal with it and how to transcend it at the same time. We, we, we have to go about, uh, beyond the immediate reaction to a situation. Mm -hmm. Just like they say, the first thing, say you say one comes down with a terminal disease and has so much time to live. Now, the first principle or the first mindset is uh, actually to actually to deny it actually it, it actually is real. And then after we get bound beyond the denial stage, we get to the stage of well, why me? Why is it happening to me? Then when we get beyond that stage, we start to think, well, well, what do I do in this situation? And then when we get beyond that stage, we start taking shelter of higher knowledge in order to bring our consciousness above this the situation that, that we find ourselves in. So this is also practical application of, uh, of spiritual knowledge. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Hare Krishna. So when you look out the window and you see all the wonderful scenery around you, you just think, hmm, Wow, this material world is so miserable. And then you feel, well, actually, I have nothing to do with this material world. So therefore, I have nothing to do with the misery that this material world is imposing. Is that okay? Yeah, that's wonderful. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Guru Maharaj, thank you so much for reminding us that it's not optional. I really think uh, I needed to hear that. Oh. First, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. All glories to Your Holiness. Thank you so much for uh, reiterating how important it is to read Srila Prabhupada's books on a regular basis with uh, concentration, with a genuine desire to understand uh, because it's uh, a, a deep thing and it's not so easy. Um, it's, uh, I think, something that goes in stages for me. I be very 
cursory and then I realize no this is important then I try to do a little better job so for me it's a struggle even to get to that point of reading with absorption but I know that's the goal so thank you for saying it's not an option I just needed to hear that thank you okay good yeah stay with something and as you stay with anything spiritual you start to it starts to uh, real reveal the knowledge that you need to know. We shouldn't be just superficially skimming through all the activities of spiritual life, but trying to go deeper in, in them. Yes, that is so true, you know, not just a cursory I had to finish 30 pages, I had to finish 41 pages, which was really the mentality I was having. But to really try to understand what Prabhupada is saying, that's a very deep thing and requires oh. effort. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Maharaj, humble obeisances, all glories to Sri Prabhupada, all glories to yourself. Hare Krishna Maharaj. My question was about um, how does uh, reading and knowledge fit into the nine processes of perfection of devotional service? Is it um, uh, something we do throughout the whole nine processes? How, how does that work, Maharaj? Well, the nine processes, the first one is Shravanam, which is hearing. And Prabhupada mentions, and it's also written, that each of the nine processes required the principle of hearing, such as chanting, we have to hear, remembering, before we can remember, we have to re hear about what we're going to remember, worshiping, we have to hear about how to worship, offering prayers, we have to hear about what are the prayers and how to offer prayers, service, that's another one, uh, so all of the nine processes are situated on the process of hearing. And reading is hearing. Hearing is hearing, reading is hearing. Both are two forms of receiving knowledge orally. So yeah, each of the, each of the bhakti processes requires a sufficient amount and regular amount of hearing like that. The more you hear about something, the more you can remember what it is. Thank you, Thank you for clarifying that, Maharaj, because I was wondering where reading would fit into that, but now I understand that um, reading is part of hearing as well and that's so yeah. important to understand the knowledge mm -hmm. yeah read you're taking in oral you're taking in sound vibration coming off the pages of, the, of a book and you're actually hearing And hearing is the, it's like Prabhupada would say, don't try to become Krishna conscious spice. You're using your visual power. Don't try to understand a saintly person simply by seeing them. You can understand a saintly person by hearing from them. I think this is Maharaj, we, we need to hear, but we also need to understand. And I think that sometimes can be the difficulty of um, really understanding what you're hearing. If you actively participate in the hearing process or the reading process, you'll start to understand. It comes by activating the principle of wanting to learn as you are reading. 
and not just reading. Mm -hmm. That's called active here, active reading. It's also called, sometimes it's called prayerful reading. We, we covered that in our seminar, reading in a prayerful mood. Prayerful means we're, try, we're trying to receive not only the knowledge, but also the proper mood in order to make the knowledge, uh, what we say, understandable. So yeah, active hearing, active reading. It's like we're speaking. So you can hear my words, but when you listen closely, really closely, you hear more than just the words. You hear the intentions behind the words. That's true in any of our interactions with other individuals. When we're in our conversations, the more we're tuned into the hearing process, the more we get the message coming. The more we get the essence of the message, the intention behind the message. Thank you, Maharaj. I think it's very deep, but I think it's um, so important to listen attentively. Thank you for that. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada and all glories to you. Uh, I would have a follow-up question to the previous one because uh, you mentioned that uh, we can also hear the intentions. And uh, I was wondering how can we properly hear the intentions because uh, I was thinking that uh, sometimes in our, our, uh, my day-to-day -day life, uh, I, I don't understand properly the, the intentions because uh, it's filtered by my mind. Yeah, well, well, yeah, by concentrating on the hearing, hearing process, we can get through that filtering process. What is being said or how is it being said? What is the intention behind it? What is the purpose behind it? Mm -hmm. Um, that's true in all forms of conversation, even ordinary day-to-day -day life. <laughs> and uh, when you actually learn that process of hearing, because again, what you pointed out is very important, that the mind has a tendency to filter. The mind also may also uh, pick up on either accepting or rejecting the sound as the sound is coming. But if you become somewhat open to what is being said, of course that can also hurt you too. <laughs> Just like it says that in our Krishna consciousness, devotees generally um, still need to learn how the process of hearing. Why? Because in their material life, in order to stay free from the the attacks of the external energy, the mind get, has a protective agency called blocking out sounds, blocking out intentions. And it's a preservative thing that we use as a defense mechanism to live in this world. But then again, when you come to Krishna consciousness, that has to change. If you keep that defense mechanism out, that, that uh, filtering process out, you fail to go deeper into the knowledge and the intention about how the knowledge was presented. So due to our conditioning, we have that tendency to filter or block out. I see. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. It's like sometimes a person may not be speaking so pleasantly. 
because of just the way he, they speak. And then, but, but sometimes you find behind that, uh, you know, the, the way it's being presented, there's a lot of knowledge, there's a lot of depth, there's a lot of important points. But because of the, how the communication is given, we fail to get to that point. We even fail to understand the intention of the individual. So of course, it's important that people who are in the position learn how to speak to others in such a way as that their presentation of the knowledge they're giving or just the interaction doesn't become a blockage in communication. Mm -hmm. Therefore, speech is, a, is, a, is an opulence. How one speaks, it's an opulence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you very much. It's uh, I just uh, had this uh, experience lately uh, in in Hungary. They are translating uh, Mahaparata series, and uh, I was watching it, and and I was really amazed uh, how how they spoke uh, with all the time some uh, metaphors and and like that that. Uh, that uh, I really started to appreciate that uh, how much uh, uh, speaking can be an art. Uh, yeah, yeah. And um, this topic uh, which I asked was uh, a bit uh, uh, important for me, not really in uh, in day to day life, but because uh, previously I, I I noticed that uh, uh, sometimes I have a tendency to use this also when uh, when I read that, um, for example, I have a conflict with someone and I read uh, uh, Srimad Bhagavatam and I find some part and, and uh, I use it that, yeah, this is why I was true and the other person was wrong. And actually this is not uh, the purpose we should read. And, uh, and I, I was really uh, surprised uh, that this can also be, um, how to say, a wrong type of reading. Yeah, I mean, that's not completely wrong. Sometimes you want to understand the argument deeper and you find that what you read has actually supported your position or maybe supported another position. I, we, we find that people misunderstand each other because they don't really hear properly. Or we have a tendency to uh, come to conclusions before we actually understand. Just like even nowadays, this is very common. People will hear something about the Hare Krishnas and uh, from different people and make their judgment or make their understanding based on what they hear. And it could be completely wrong. Mm -hmm. Or somebody will talk about another person because they'll talk about that person from their own point of view or their own experience with that person. But for that, for that person who may also have a relationship with that person they're talking about may be completely different. Mm. And will be in many cases. Mm. Yeah. Yes. Thank you very much. Yeah, I, communication is an art. <laughs> Anyone else would like to say something? If not, we can stop here and we can continue tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, same time. Tomorrow we'll uh, continue for at least three more days uh, speaking about the importance of reading and hearing from Srila Prabhupada.
Okay, thank you very much. And uh, we'll see you all tomorrow. Hare Krishna, Guru Maharaj. Thank you so much for the wonderful class, Guru Maharaj. Um, thank you so much for uh, giving, um, reminding us one more time the importance of reading the Srila Prabhupada books. Thank you so much, Guru Maharaj. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, Guru Maharaj. Thank you for hosting. <laughs> thank you for the opportunity, Guru Maharaj, and your blessings. Thank you. Hare Krishna. You are expert. <laughs> no, Guru Maharaj, I'm still learning. I'm, I'm not expert. <laughs> Now you're arguing with me. No. <laughs> <laughs> but I know that I'm not an expert. That's what I'm <laughs> Well, I am appreciative of how you conducted today's ceremony. Very nice. Thank you. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Maravananda Hare Krishna. Jai Ho. Hare Krishna, Guru Maharaj. Thank you so much. Nilo Chala. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, Guru Maharaj. Thank you. Shamarani. Thank you very much for the day. Nikhil. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, Maharaj. Thank you very much for the lovely class. Where is Prabhupada? Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. All the rest of you. Hare Krishna, Guru Maharaj. Hare Krishna, Guru Maharaj. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Guru Maharaj. Thank you very much. Did you get my um, text message? Yes, Guru Maharaj. I think I'll try and go to Gita Nagari. Let's see. Okay. We can talk more. Okay. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj. Thank you very much for, for this class and always uh, emphasizing these basics, which I, I tend to forget. <laughs> thank you so thank much. You. Thank you for taking an active understanding of this philosophy. It's a nice example for all of us, your enthusiasm to know more. And this is what we should be, we should all be like that, wanting to know more and more and more. Mm -hmm. well, I'm just all the time here that I know nothing. <laughs> and when, when this, uh, this feeling goes, that's, that's uh, even worse. <laughs> so thank you so much for, for giving your, your uh, precious knowledge. Thank you Hare. very much. Hare Krishna. The power power, I'll go to see you, Guru Maharaj. Madan Gopal. Hare Krishna. Good to hear your voice after 100 centuries. It's been a long time. <laughs> My face is changing color. <laughs> okay, I look forward to when we can again be together. Me too, Guru Maharaj. Like, it's, it's my biggest joy in this world. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj. Humble obeisances to you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tushar. So tomorrow we'll, we connect uh, at 7 o'clock or 6 o'clock UK time? No, we're not connecting on Monday, Guru Maharaj. I, I sent you an email. We're going to oh. it for a week because... We're still working, myself and Junkin are still working on things. So we're proposing for to delay by one more week. Another week? Hmm. The 14th. Yeah, I have other issues that have been coming up in my own day-to-day you know, -day life that I wanted to present. So I guess we can wait on that. All right. So... Uh, As you wish, Guru Maharaj. If you want just myself and other Bhakti involved, then... That's fine too. I'll uh, I'll contact you. Okay, thank you. Hari Hari. Hare Krishna. Hari Bo. Hari Bo Susanna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.
Guru Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. Our Guru wish to share for what in your sat. Thank you very much for this wonderful class. I am not doing anything. I'm just repeating. Mm -hmm. No, actually not. This is uh, something that um, these lectures in the past few days uh, made me think of why I uh, can't uh, um, shut up sometimes and don't listen to other people because I'm inattentive. So thank you very much. Thank you. The hearing process is the most important part of our uh, understanding through hearing. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Okay, so Hare Krishna, all glories to Shiva Prabhupada. Hare Krishna, Guru Maharaj. Guru Maharaj, you are, are you getting my um, daily register uh, sheets, Guru Maharaj? Yeah, I haven't checked today, but okay. from, Just from yesterday, yesterday I, I think I received something. Okay. It's, it's, fine. it's fine, it's in line with uh, the right uh, labeling now. Yes, yes, Guru Maharaj. Just want to confirm with you, Guru Maharaj. Thank you. Good, thank you.